Well, we've covered quite a bit of ground in the first five lectures of this series, and we now come to a point where I want to pull a few things together and, and really start moving us into uh, the world context in which we currently find ourselves. One of the major strands of what I've been trying to say over the previous five lectures is that human beings have come to understand their identity in increasingly psychological categories over the years. Now, Marx is a little different. Marx, of course, emphasizes the, the importance of economic structure, economic material factors, and the way we think. But the other thinkers, Rousseau, the Romantics, Nietzsche, Oscar Wilde, really tend to focus on the, the inner will of the human being, our inner psychological life as absolutely determinative of who we are. And we see that perhaps in its most extreme form in, in Nietzsche theoretically and in Wilde practically. But there's another step in the story we need to tell in order to understand the kind of culture and politics we live in at the moment. Yes, I would want to say we live in a world where the self is, is highly psychologized, but also the self is highly sexualized now. Sexual desire has come to perform a role within society, to come to perform a role in personal identity that is pretty much unprecedented in history. The sexualizing of psychology, the sexualizing of the self, that's the next big stage in our story. And in order to understand this, we need to know something about uh, the great grandfather of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud, brought up in a, a fairly secular Jewish a Viennese household, was most famous as the founder of psychoanalysis. His dates, 1856 to 1939. Like Marx, he died uh, an exile in London. Uh, of course, the reason for uh, Freud's exile was much more to do with the rise of Nazism and violent anti-Semitism on the continent. Marx was a political exile because of his revolutionary activities. Now today it's certainly true that Freud's psychoanalytic theories, his theory of the subconscious, his idea of the Oedipus complex, etc., these things are pretty much discredited. If they're taught in schools of psychology at all, they're museum pieces or they're part of the grand historical narrative that bring us to today. They're not particularly living as ideas and important concepts. But culturally, culturally, his legacy lives on in two important respects. Culturally, he's really the founder of the idea that sex and sexual desire is foundational to human happiness and therefore to human identity. You think about uh, who am I? You ask yourself, who am I? Uh, what am I doing here? Probably the kind of answer you're going to give to that question to some extent is going to involve what makes you happy? Well, Freud's the man who really pinpoints sex as that which makes people happy. So that's the first thing. Uh, first thing that Freud's uh, legacy uh, means today, we think of sex as identity rather than activity. And secondly, he bequeaths us a theory of culture which places sexual codes at the very heart of what it means to be civilized. In a sense, Freud would say, if you want to know uh, what makes a culture tick, if you want to go to the very heart of what a culture considers valuable, you should look at the codes of sexual behavior embodied in that society. That will take you to the essence of that particular culture. Another thing to notice about Freud, of course, is that he does this using the most compelling and persuasive of modern idioms, the language of science. One of the things, the advantages, if you like, that Freud has over, say, a Rousseau or a Nietzsche or a Wilde is Freud talks in the language of science. And really, since the early 19th century, science has become a very persuasive form of rhetoric for grabbing the attention. Think of the recent COVID crisis and how much the scientists, rather than, say, the politicians or the philosophers, have tended to dominate and control public policy. Why? It's because scientists and the scientific idiom grip our imaginations. They have an intrinsic authority. Even though many of us don't understand their arguments, when something is expressed in the scientific idiom, we tend to grant it an authority and a status. And that's the genius of Freud. Freud puts across ideas that quite often are very fanciful. 
And if you pick below the surface, are not particularly scientific in a traditional sense. But because he uses the language, the rhetoric, the jargon of science, his arguments carry huge weight with us. If you think for a moment about the implications of that legacy of Freud that I talked about, uh, it's the intuitive position today, isn't it, that we think of identity in terms of sexual desire. Think of the labels that are routinely used in our politics, straight, gay, lesbians, etc. Those labels only make sense in a world where sexual desire is identity. That's the legacy of Freud. And when you think about the way sexual codes have been transformed, changed, in some cases abolished over the last 50 years, it takes you to the heart of what's going on in society, to the heart of what's going on in our culture. That which society finds sexually unacceptable tells you an awful lot about what that society thinks of itself and what it values. The other thing about Freud is, as part of his, his legacy of, of sexual identity, is that he projects sexuality back into childhood. Freud was one of those who argued that human beings are always sexual, even infants. Think of the implications of that. If sex is identity and infants are sexual, that has immediate implications for things like education. Sex education, in that kind of context, will become a hot-button political issue. Think of the modern world. Most, some of the most contentious debates about education, even at elementary school level, focus on issues of sexuality among children. Think about how those things play out in terms of parental rights versus child's rights. Think of how that shapes the state's notion of its own responsibility towards children, etc. So when Freud turns sex from behavior into identity, he accomplishes a revolution that has transformed all of our lives. We simply can't ignore, if you like, the contribution, the legacy of Freud on this point. And what I want to do in the remaining minutes of this lecture is expound just a few of his ideas to show how this sort of fits together in his thinking. First thing I want to look at is Freud and happiness. Happiness, of course, as the purpose of life is pretty basic for most of us. You know, when we ask the question, does life have meaning, what's life about, we could probably translate that as, what is it that's going to make me feel happy and satisfied? Aristotle, the great, uh, great Greek philosopher, thought the happy life was the virtuous life, a life lived cultivating and according to virtues that enabled one to interact within the polis, within wider society in a good and wholesome way. Christianity, of course, thinks that happiness is to be found only ultimately in heaven, but here on earth is to be found uh, through uh, worshipping uh, and acting uh, in obedience to, to God. With the Enlightenment, 17th and 18th century, notions of happiness start to shift a little. Happiness became increasingly identified with pleasure and unhappiness with pain. And Freud, in many ways, is the culmination of that enlightenment trajectory of happiness, pleasure, unhappiness, pain. And Freud, this will come as no surprise to you, I'm sure, when he asked the question, what makes us happy? Answers that it is sexual activity. That does so. I have a couple of quotations here I'm going to read from his great work, Civilization and Its Discontents. What do people demand of this life and wish to achieve in it? The answer to this can hardly be in doubt. They strive after happiness. They want to become happy and to remain so. This endeavor has two sides, a positive and a negative aim. It aims on the one hand at an absence of pain and unpleasure, and on the other, at the experiencing of strong feelings of pleasure, end quote. So far, so good. In many ways, uh, Freud is not saying anything there that countless people before him, standing in the, uh, under the, uh, in the shadow of the Enlightenment, might well have said. But he goes on to give it a distinctively Freud twist. What does this mean? What does this happiness mean? I quote again from Christian, uh, Civilization, Its Discontents. Man's discovery that sexual, that is genital love, afforded him the strongest experiences of satisfaction and in fact provided him with the prototype of all happiness must have suggested to him that he could, should continue to seek the satisfaction of happiness 
in his life along the path of sexual relations and that he should make genital erotism the central point of his life. Notice what Freud, in quote, notice what Freud is saying there. He's saying the erotic sexual desire and sexual satisfaction become central to human life, basically foundational to who we are, how we think, and how we act. That's quite a contrast to early history where sex was uh, probably a pleasurable activity, but it was not central to who we considered ourselves to be. It wasn't the meaning of life, one might say, or the meaning of any of us as individuals. But Freud saying, no, no, it is. That's really what drives us all. So the first thing that the first contribution of Paul Freud is he makes that move that says, you know, sex, sexual desire, that determines you. It determines what you aim for in life. It is your identity. Secondly, Freud then reflects upon morality. What, why do we have strong moral codes? What's the basis for them? And he uses, and this is actually one of my favorite uh, passages in Freud because it, it really makes his point uh, rather nicely and in a rather amusing way as well. He's talking about sexual codes. And he says this, Those who contem condemn the other sexual practices, he's thinking here about homosexuality, I think, which have no doubt been common among mankind from primeval times as being perversions, are giving away to an unmistakable feeling of disgust, which protects them from accepting sexual aims of this kind. The limits of such disgust are, however, often purely conventional. Notice what Freud is saying there. He's saying, you know, we have these moral codes, but when you start to think about them, they're actually pretty conventional. Now, a Christian, of course, would disagree and say, no, our sexual codes reflect the law of God. And Freud would say, no, no, your sexual codes actually reflect what you find disgusting. And then he goes on to ask whether, is that really a rational thing at all? He says, the limits of such disgust are, however, often purely conventional. A man who will kiss a pretty girl's lips passionately may perhaps be disgusted at the idea of using her toothbrush. Though there are no grounds for supposing that his own oral cavity, for which he feels no disgust, is any cleaner than the girl's. Here then our attention is drawn to the factor of disgust which interferes with the libidinal overvaluation of the sexual object, but can in turn be overridden by the libido. Disgust seems to be one of the forces which have led to restriction of the sexual aim. End quote. Example Freud uses there. He said, you think about it. Kissing is a pleasurable activity. You enjoy kissing other people. But you wouldn't use their toothbrush because that's disgusting. And yet Freud's making the point that actually... It's no more hygienic to kiss somebody, probably far less hygienic than it is to use their toothbrush. So why is it that the one is desirable and the other one is disgusting? Well, he says, the one fulfills sexual desire, the other does not. And then, of course, he's drawing this parallel with sexual codes broadly. He says, there's a whole range of sexual activities out there that disgust us. But the basis for that is irrational. There is no transcendent law that says these things are wrong. They're merely, if you like, conventions that society has cultivated. That, of course, then raises the question of why? Why is it cultivated, these particular rules about these particular things? Now, before I answer that question, I just want you to note here the similarity with uh, Friedrich Nietzsche and Oscar Wilde on this point, where ethical claims claims that we make about right and wrong are really things that Nietzsche and Wilde would say, no, no, they're not claims about right and wrong. They're claims about taste. You say that's wrong, but what you really mean is you find it distasteful. You say that's right, and what you really mean is you find that tasteful. So with Freud, we get the, the sort of the scientific sledgehammer being brought to bear on traditional moral codes. That leads me then to my third point, Freud and civilization. Why are these moral codes the way they are? Why do they exist if they're irrational and merely grounded in taste? Well, Freud's idea is this. Society, for its own well-being, cultivates within us over time 
The idea that these things are absolutes and makes us feel guilty when we transgress them. To quote again from his famous essay, Civilization and Its Discontents. Primitive man, he says, was better off in knowing no restrictions of instinct. To counterbalance this, his prospects of enjoying this happiness for any length of time were very slender. Civilized man has exchanged a portion of his possibilities of happiness for a portion of security. Here, Freud gives the ideal man of nature, remember Rousseau's sort of noble savage, a distinctively Freudian sexual identity. As with Rousseau, Freud sort of imagines a world where primitive man knew no restrictions. In this case, there were no sexual restrictions, and he was therefore free to fulfill himself and fulfill his happiness. But Freud is also more pessimistic than Rousseau, for such happiness would surely be short-lived, and it would be risky because it played into the hands of only the most immediately powerful individuals, presumably male individuals, and left the rest of society vulnerable and unsatisfied. In other words, Freud's saying, if you have this noble savage and he's basically a sexual beast, you have total chaos. You have sexually violent chaos. And if society is going to survive, it cannot allow that to happen. So what society does is it engages in this trade-off. It introduces restrictions of sexual desire in order for people to be able to live together. This is achieved by what Freud calls the superego, which is essentially that by which we internalize society's moral codes and which cultivates guilty feelings. Think about when you're a kid, first time you steal a cookie from the cookie jar. Uh, maybe you didn't know it was wrong and your mum tells you off. Over time, you begin to feel guilty about engaging in behavior like that. So that even when your mom is absent, even when she can't know what you're doing, you don't steal a cookie because you feel guilty. You've internalized your mother's moral code relative to the cookie jar, such that it's kind of self-policing at that point. And that's what Freud sees society doing in terms of sexual codes. What it's doing is it's trading off elements of individual freedom, curving twisting, if you like, individual identity in order that we can all live together. The energy, the pent-up energy that's caused by this, Freud sees as redirected into other pursuits, religion, art, culture. If you look at Bernini's statue of the Passion of St. Teresa and look at the expression on St. Teresa's face, it's a deeply sexual expression. And Freud would say that's a good example where Bernini's sexual energy has been redirected into his work of creation and art at that point. And that's where Freud sees religion, even though he's a very anti-religious thinker. He sees religion as performing a useful role. He says this in his essay on religion, The Future of an Illusion. Quote, Religion has clearly performed great services for human civilization. It has contributed much towards the taming of asocial instincts. What Freud is essentially saying there is religion's nonsense, but it fulfills a useful function. It frightens people into behaving appropriately so that civilization can exist. It's because we are worried about judgment after death, if you like, that we behave ourselves here and now. So Freud is that oddest of thinkers in some ways. He's an imminent frame thinker. He doesn't think there's any transcendence, but he thinks it's useful that people do believe there is some transcendence so that they will behave in appropriate and civilized manner here on earth. But it also points to the Freudian dilemma. If the trade-off for civilization is curbing sexual instincts and sexual desires, then happiness, proper perfect happiness, is by definition impossible. Every human being is going to live at some level as a level of sexual frustration. So that's the reason for the title of his little essay, Civilization and Its Discontents. To have civilization requires that the members of society be discontented because they are forfeiting the possibility of their individual happiness for a corporate stability, which we call culture or civilization. So as we draw our thoughts to a close on Freud then, and I've just barely 
touched the surface of this man's thinking and his influence. What can we say about Freud's role in the story we are telling so far? Well, in some ways, we can see him as the heir of Rousseau with this thought experiment about what would human beings like, be like in this sort of primeval, uncivilized state. So he's like Rousseau, and he quotes Rousseau in his works. But he presents us with a much darker picture of human nature, where the noble savage is not so noble. The noble savage is a sexual, destructive savage. Secondly, he makes, as I said at the start, Freud makes sex and sexuality the fundamental dimension of what it means to be human. Sex thus becomes identity. The identity politics represented, for example, by the LGBTQ plus movement, that's a relatively recent thing and it's deeply indebted to the way of thinking about culture and humanity that we find articulated so powerfully and clearly in the works of Freud. He also points to the fundamental irrationality of human beings. He makes it clear that you know, many of the things that motivate us, our moral codes, for example, he would say, are not rational. It's desire. It's our dark, irrational desires that really shape who we are. And therefore, he provides this kind of, I would say, pseudo-scientific foundation for seeing moral codes as ultimately disguised taste codes. We say good and evil, we really mean tasteful, distasteful, according to Freud. And that's brought us to a significant juncture in our story, of course, because now we're beginning to understand how this psychologized identity, this expressive individualism, takes on this sexual form in the 20th century. But there is one more step we have to take before we can reflect on contemporary culture, and that is, why does this stuff become so political in the form it does? And that piece of the puzzle is provided by one of Freud's former colleagues, a very strange and rather extreme Marxist thinker, Wilhelm Reich, in the mid-20th century. And it's to Reich's ideas that we will turn in the next lecture.